Once again, I want to welcome you uh, to Live from My Drum Room. I really appreciate you all tuning in today. It's really a pleasure to welcome a friend for so many years, one of the absolute great drummers of all time and my dear friend. Please welcome, celebrating his 50th anniversary with the band Kansas, my good pal Phil Ehart is here today. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good to be here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, Phil. Thank you for being here, buddy. Thanks for thanks for waiting patiently for me. Yeah, no problem. I'm sitting where I'm used to sitting. <laughs> Man, <laughs> I mean, that's usually I get paid for it. <laughs> this is a, I'm, I'm kidding. Okay. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great, Phil. I'm doing great. It's great to see you, man. Now, now people need to understand that John De Christopher is one of the well-known, nice guys in the music business. He's always been great to us when you worked with Zildjian and, and our friendships and doing things like this. You're, you're a drummer's drummer. And oh. I just want to say that. Oh, Phil, thank you so much, man. That, that means the world. Thank you. I, you know, I, during the intro, you know, I was, I was just saying it's, it's, this is long overdue having you on the show. And I'm, you know, I just have, I told you this and I've told you before, I just have so much love and respect for you and as a person and as a drummer. Um, well, thank you. Thanks. One of the, one of the greats. And you know, Phil, jumping right in, when we were talking last week, you told me something that I, I didn't know. And it surprised the heck out of me that you're a self-taught drummer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I didn't have much choice living in the Philippines or living in Japan or living out in the country in Montana while my dad put missiles in the ground during the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, I haven't always lived in the most, and of course, ending up in Kansas, I haven't always lived in the most musically uh, acclimated places in the world, but, uh, but I did okay. I'm on your show. I couldn't have done that bad. <laughs> you did better than okay, my friend. Man, oh. you, you know, I, I think like everybody else watching and all your fans and all the drummer fans that you have, when I hear you play, you sound like such a polished, I, it's the best way I can explain it. You have, you have a very schooled sound and, and approach. You sound like a, somebody that I just assumed you could read, you know, the, the old expression, uh, you know, fly shit out, you know, whatever you, you could sight read and, and, but man, yeah. you're a natural. Well, I, I appreciate that coming from a drummer of your stature. That means a lot, but uh, I, I did the best I could do, you know, and, and uh, you know, the first drum set I got was a, an old Slingerland set that didn't even have any cymbals and, and only had a snare and a, and a, and a uh, kick drum. And I just kind of figured out stuff, played along with Beatles records and things. And then I would graduate to like one Tom Tom, saved up, you know, a lawn mowing money, yeah. bought myself a Tom Tom or a cymbal or whatever. I, you know, I was going to figure it out because I had plenty of time living in the places where I lived. There was a lot of spare time and, and I would practice, but I, I was gifted uh, with the ability of natural rhythm. So I'm not saying things came easy to me, but they came a little easier because I could just sit down and this made sense to me. I could do different things with different limbs. And I, I was very fortunate to have that ability. Yeah. And you mentioned the Beatles. So I, and, and that makes sense, you know, knowing that, you know, when you, when you grew up, what you'd be listening to. So they were obviously an early influence for you. Ringo. Oh, and, oh yeah. 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 Now, of course, everybody mentions the Ed Sullivan show. Well, me too. You know, I was watching it in Great Falls, Montana, as my dad was stationed up there. So it was, that's where, you know, it all made sense to me. Like Steve Walsh said, when he said the first time he saw the Beatles, he thought to himself, this makes sense to me. And, and I, I admit the same thing. It, it, it made sense. That's how it's supposed to sound. So it had a big influence on on a lot of guys that were my age at that time. Yeah, yeah. Had you had you already been playing drums at that point? You would have been about maybe 12 or so at that yeah. time? Yeah, um, I was. And uh, again, just in my bedroom, 
uh, with to the radio. Yeah, that was that. That's how I turn on the radio, and of course the Beatles were playing, and and I try to play along to it. And uh, try is the key word there. Try to play along to it, and and it was uh, so great to see them on television where it came to life. I could see what Ringo was doing. Go, that's what that guy's doing there, you know. And uh, so it was real exciting. It was an exciting time. Yeah, it sure was. And and you, I mean, when you look at the the history of of you and the band, which I know that um, the the band sort of started off as um, White Clover. I had to. I didn't wanted to make sure I got. I you you yeah. told me some of this stuff, and I and I've done a little bit of research, and um, yeah. it basically right out of high school that band formed right i mean you guys were yeah yeah it was you know uh, richard richard and i were in a band before that richard williams and, and i were in a band before that called the pets yeah and um <laughs> we we actually got our high school prom gig <laughs> <laughs> and of course this does connect to me being an idiot so um i <laughs> I took my drum set, which I had paid for myself, and uh, made it almost through the whole set, playing it for all my friends and and acquaintances and everybody in high school at the high school prom. My drum stool snapped. I was at the end of a song, came down to hit the singer at the end, boom, gone off the riser. And because uh, we were on a little riser, and the last thing I saw was, was Rich. Rich, hell, of course, he's facing the other way, you know. And I go off the back only to hit the ground and look up, and I see my parents who didn't tell me they were coming. They were going to surprise me, which they did, because I'm lying on my back looking up at them. And they're going, like, Is this part of the show? Is this something you're supposed to do? If you did, great job, you know. But, uh, after that, I never used another uh, drum stool unless it was a throne, you know, one of the cylinder thrones yeah. that uh, Buddy uh, Rich used and Slingerland made and stuff. But most of the time I sat on a suitcase, a suitcase, and that's what I put all my hardware in. And yeah. then when I set up my drums, I closed the suitcase, put it on its end, and that's what I sat on. So I wasn't going to have that happen again. And, and eventually I was able to afford a nice drum throne, and, and I bought that. So, uh, so yeah, that was my introduction to the high school. I tried to jump up and, you know, like it's part of the show, I'm fine, but everybody you was know, a complete idiot. And, yeah. uh, and that's whatever stuff happens. That's a man, you know, you, you got to treasure those memories, right? I mean, those high school <laughs> proms and dances. Yeah, I don't know if treasure's the word, but I do remember them. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, and I am reminded from time to time, you know, don't get too uppity because you'll fall off your drum riser, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's part of the gig. And and some of those guys in that band are went on are some of the guys that went on to form Kansas. Yeah, Rich Williams. Rich, uh, okay, yeah. Guitar. Yeah, he and I uh uh started Pets and and then from there uh there was a, a different number of incarnations of White Clover. Rich was in some and not in others and stuff. But by the time we and, and even, you know, uh, some of the early Kansas like Kansas one the stuff that I played in, Rich wasn't in. Uh, he, he was going to college and things like that. And uh, he didn't really join up with me for Kansas till uh, I returned from L London, where I'd gone over there to, to, to play. And when I got back, he was the first guy I called. There was no doubt. I'm calling Rich. <laughs> and I did. And that's kind of where Kansas, today's Kansas, started. Uh, Carrie and I had messed with some other different incarnations right. of uh, Kansas and uh, uh, that Richard uh, wasn't a part of, but uh, he uh, eventually joined up and the rest is history. 50 years, most of history. Yeah. And I was going to say, and, and that's, that's, as you say, the sort of current incarnation of Kansas. But when you think about going back to, I mean, it goes back even further, right? Almost you know, the sort of origins, the genesis of the band, like closer to 55 years, right? Yeah, it is. Pretty wild, man. It, it, yeah. it, the name, the name Kansas, yes. Uh, there's been, you know, a number of different players. The fans know who they are. They know better than I do. I can't remember. <laughs> which is great. And um, so, yeah, it's uh, the, the original six uh, that we refer to as, of course, myself and Richard, and Carrie and Dave, 
and Steve and Robbie. That's the original six. Those, those are the guys that uh, got signed. Those are the guys that got signed to Don Kirshner. So we, that our first really original recording, uh, Kirshner Records was with those six guys. And that to us will always be the original six. Yeah, and yep. uh, or the O six or whatever they're referred to, but but yeah, that's really where where our I don't want to say fame, but success started at that time. Pretty much before that, we were a club club band, and you can imagine us playing clubs or or proms with <laughs> all with like eleven different time signatures per song. <laughs> you know, we we weren't too popular. You know. <laughs> Play anything we can dance to? No, sorry. But uh, <laughs> but we got paid anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, I, obviously you've you've absolutely found your audience, my friend. I mean, you've got some serious fans out there. Yeah, I, I want I want to correct that. They found us. Right. I don't take any credit for our fan base. Our fan base found us, yeah. and uh, that's why they're the best fans in the world. Yeah. They, they found us and they held on to us, you know, as I'm like, yeah, well, they're kind of weird, can't dance. And that's even why on our on our documentary, we put on the back that the Surgeon General uh, advises that you not try to dance to Kansas music <laughs> at the risk of hurting yourself. And Because I, we knew our fans would get it. Our fans get us. Most other people scratch their head and go, OK, this is not for me. But it, it is, um, our fans are everything to us. That's, we take that seriously. That's, you know, it's great that you, I, th I just think, and we're, by the way, we're broadcasting this to the fan page on Facebook, the Kansas page. And it's just, yeah, that's so great that you acknowledge your fans the way you do. And, and you always have, as long as I've known you and the band has. Yes. And uh, that, that's, that's, you know, that's great. That's just so great. Um, but I, I got it. So I, so how does how did you and how did the band? Um, I'm thinking at some point you changed the sort of trajectory of going in the more prog direction that that we've that you're known for now. But when you guys started playing as young musicians, you were probably playing more sort of straight ahead rock and roll kind of stuff. Yeah, we we were we we had a an interesting discovery of us was our manager in Topeka, Phil Muso. And Phil was from New Orleans. And Phil came to me one day and he goes, Phil, and I go, Phil. And he goes, well, uh, I have a chance of booking you guys down in, in New Orleans. I said, okay, what do we need to do? And he said, well, you'd play a club on Bourbon Street. Actually, it was on Royal, I think it was. And it was called The Roach. Mm. And I thought, <laughs> oh, well, that's, that'll be the high school proms. Uh, by a long ways, and and so we went down there, and uh, none of the guys in the first White Clover that went down there were in uh, the band Kansas. Okay, uh, they eventually uh, got into Kansas, but the first group that went down there was a different group, and we got down there, and uh, it was a little tiny uh, club, it wasn't a pub, and it was a club, and it had place where people could dance or whatever, but mainly where they could drink. And they came right, and it was in the French Quarter. So mm -hmm. you get a very varied looking, acting type of crowd that wanders in and they'll listen and leave or listen and get a drink or listen and get a drink and leave or whatever was supposed to happen. And um, so we were playing there. We were booked. We were booked 80, 89 nights out of 90. We were booked three straight months. And uh, the only reason the one night was off was the toilet overflowed. <laughs> so that, and most of the thing is, most of the crowd was so drunk they didn't even notice. So, but, but we did. And so the guy closed down the club for the evening until he could get the toilet fixed. And uh, we came back the next night and kept playing. It was through a whole summer. And, um, and it was the kind of thing that we took a break, you know, every hour or two, we took a break. And we're sitting in our little table uh, there that, that we sat at and the club owner comes over and he goes, guys, um, you see that guy over there at the bar, guy with the big hair and the beard and stuff. And I looked over and I'm like, yeah, he goes, that's Jim Morrison. <laughs> the Jim Morrison. Yeah. That's the Jim Morrison of the door. 
he wants to come over and talk to you guys. Um, okay, <laughs> what do you say? Now nah, we're busy. No, it was like, oh, okay, um, sure. So he comes over and he was very nice. And he pulled up a chair, of course, turned it around backwards and put his arm. They said, so he said, look, uh, you guys are really good. You guys are really good. I was wondering if I could try out some of my poetry uh, with you guys, with you guys playing behind me. He said, I'd like you to, he said, I noticed you played Light My Fire. I'd like you to play Light My Fire. And in the middle section, I'm going to quote and read some of my poetry. Man. I'd like to try it out on the audience, see what people think. Okay, great. I mean, it was so surreal. Oh. That's Jim Morrison. I mean, the Jim Morrison. And, um, and of course, Light My Fire was huge at the time. Um, he was on all the news because of his and in this indecent exposure, he said, which he didn't do. So whatever, we yeah. didn't care. And it was the kind of thing that, uh, so we go up on stage. Now there's no phones, there's no cameras, there's no nothing. It's just us. And there's about 200 people in there. And all of a sudden we kind of start hearing, you know, Jim Morrison, Jim Morrison, the people are starting to notice. And so I counted it off one, two, three, bam, done. We, and we come in with light my fire. Well, our singer, uh, Greg Allen, uh, started singing light my fire. We got to the middle and the guys are kind of rocking back and forth on the chords. And here comes Jim and he walks up and he starts quoting this, his poetry starts reading it. Well, I mean, it's unbelievable. Oh he, my God. The, I mean, it's, it's something, you know, you're there for this is yeah. it. Yeah. And, um, and so he's talking about a young Indian boy, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And he's quoting all this stuff. And, uh, and so we're just kind of <laughs> playing along. We get to the last verse and going to the last verse and we get to the end of the song and he turns around and he looks at me and the guys in the band does this, does this, walks off the front of the stage, out the club, into the French quarter, never to be seen again by us yeah, anyway. Yeah. So out he goes and we're just kind of sitting there and that was it. And it was unbelievable. I mean, it's, you can't describe, you know, not only being a fan, but respecting his music and the John Densmore and Robbie Krieger and Ray Manzarek, all the guys that he played with were just so incredible. And, and we, we got to do that. Now I'm only 19, you know, I'm one year out of high school and I'm, you know, Jim Morrison was this this close. I could reach out and touch him while I'm playing, you know. And so that that left a mark. You know, that was something that yeah. but what went on to happen is that we also left a mark on him. Because it gets weirder. I, so we're in there. Now we're back with a different, now we're back with a different band. We're back with Kansas, uh, which was a different incarnation, one of the original first, first uh incarnations of the band and um i get a call from the uh from the uh, bartender uh, during we're rehearsing during the day phil this is uh so and so so he manages and i'm sorry i don't remember his name S simmons i think was his name and um he said he wants to talk to somebody from uh, the doors camp uh, to somebody in kansas and well, everybody looks at me and I go, okay. So I walk over and yeah, uh, hey, Phil, you know, it's possible. Blah, blah, blah. And we're coming to Atlanta to headline at the uh, at the warehouse. And we'd like Kansas to open for us. We don't usually have an opening band, but Jim really likes you guys and wants to invite you guys to open for the doors. Okay. It, it, it's, it, it's so, again, these yeah. are things that you would never guests being stuck in that little club in New Orleans that these kind of things would happen to. You. And so sure enough, we went and uh, down there, the, 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 uh, the warehouse was just opening up. We, we had become friends with the owners, Don Fox and those guys um, uh, of the warehouse. And uh, they were pretty pumped too, that we were going to get to do this. So we got up there and played and did our cover songs and maybe a couple of originals. Now this is with Carrie and with Dave and, uh, and you know, that we, we got up there and played. And uh, as we came off stage, Jim comes up and says, come on out for our last song. 
you got to jam with us on the last song of the evening. Uh, but so they came out and they did light my fire all by themselves, of course. And they, everybody was passing sparklers around and everything that they did. And then after that, in the encore, we came out with them for the encore for a blues song. Well, you know, uh, John Densmore was already playing drums and stuff. So I just, you know, played a tambourine and everybody just kind of jumped in and played. And at the end, we went back up to the dressing room and, you know, bro hugged. Hey, man, it was great. Uh, it was great. That was the last song they ever played. He died. Year, it was years later. It wasn't like within a week or two. It was a couple of years later. But he eventually passed. And uh, in Paris, I think, is where he passed. I think. I think yeah, so, yeah. I, yeah. I think that's where he's buried, at least. But um, we were somewhere, and somebody read, I think Dave read something that, God, you know, Jim Morrison died. Oh, man, yeah. And it said in the article, the last gig that the Doors played was in New Orleans on such and such a day. And all of a sudden, we just went, oh, my gosh, we, we played with them on their last song. And uh, so once we got through all that, that was, uh, you know, something to carry for a while. But yeah. I remember running into Robbie Krieger uh, on a golf course of all places, and I introduced myself. And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I remember you, Kansas. You, you guys were the last band that played, that played with us. He remembered that. Yeah. So it was um, it's something that's kind of been part of our history for a long time, but it's not something we really, you know, wave a flag about, but it's, uh, it's, it's never born. Let me put it that way. It's never born. No. And thank you for sharing that story, Phil, because that, that's, that's, I, I'm seriously getting the chills when you were talking about <laughs> the first time Jim came up and, and, you know, read his poetry during light my fire. And then when you guys played with him, open for them, it's just like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm from that same generation. I grew up loving the yeah. doors. I, and what a, what an amazing, you know, legacy that you have that you can share these stories, you know, unbelievable. Yeah. It's been a hell of a run. Definitely. And you're oh, nowhere oh. done. No, nowhere near done with it either. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, and, and you mentioned, um, I, and, and I'm glad you mentioned London because I know there was a, a part of your life where you, or a period of time where you moved to London to maybe just sort of explore some other opportunities. Um, yeah. And what, what, and and, uh, you, you were pretty young at the time, 18 or 19, maybe? Yeah, I, I was, uh, I was 20. You're 20. Okay. And, yeah. and how, how was that experience for you? It must have been the, the scene was pretty happening well, there at that time. Well, it, it's not so much the scene that was there, it was the scene why I left Topeka because most of us had already played with everybody. And yeah. it's not like Topeka had 7,000 musicians. It was, you know, there was a group of us that played and some of the guys with the Vietnam War coming, some of the guys went there, some of the guys went to college, some guys did other things, got married, whatever. And I was sitting there with a school bus, with our school bus that we owned, actually I owned. And um, so I sold the bus, I think it was for like 500 bucks, nice bus, 500 bucks and used the money to Go to England. I remember my dad asked me, you're going to England? I said, yeah, dad. And he goes, well, well, who do you know over there that you're going to see? And I said, nobody. You don't know anybody? No, you're just going by yourself? Yeah. And you're not going to meet anybody? No. Okay. <laughs> so he, he took me to, to uh, Kansas City, put me on a TWA flight. And my, my cases were checked as, or my drums were checked as luggage. So got on there and I landed in at Heathrow, and I ran, I ran into a guy that he was carrying a guitar, and he was looking for a band, and I was looking for a band, so I met him, he met me, and off we went, and uh, I got an apartment that you had to slug with uh, coins to get any electricity, which meant you better have a lot of money if you want electricity. <laughs> I didn't have. So I spent most of my time in a dark flat. Of course, in the daylight, fine. But as the, as the sun went down, I was just <laughs> told rich. I told rich when I got back, I said, there were my drums right next to my bed. And then there's me sitting there like this, you know, didn't drink or anything. So I'm just sitting there and the sun would go down. My dad gave me a transistor radio and I listened to the BBC on that. And that's how I got through the nights. And I finally ran into a guy that worked for uh, Wishbone Ash. Oh. And they weren't interested in me. They were interested in my drum set. So I took my drum set over there. And, and most of the bands that I met with 
uh, wanted to meet with me because I was an American. And they played the blues. Yeah. They played country. They played jazz. You know, three styles of music I did not play or didn't even know how to play. And uh, because most of the Brits and the Europeans like the American style of music. I wanted to meet somebody that was playing Deep Purple type stuff, you know, I didn't meet any of those guys. But, uh, and after a while, my uh, my visa ran out because uh, I didn't really have a job or anything. So I packed up and came home. First guy I went to was Rich. Yeah. He said, you back? And I said, yeah, are you there? He said, yeah. So I went back and there he was in his parents' basement, um, just kind of where I left. And we went in and we started talking about a new band and that was that was kansas the original sick yeah so yeah you know and i gotta think that that experience in london probably it you know oh. it didn't it, it didn't it didn't necessarily pan out over there the way you thought it might but it gave you like this renewed drive when you got back to like well it, what it did is made me realize how much i miss my other the other guys how much i yeah. miss Rick carry and all those guys that i played with yeah see i'm going to london well i couldn't get back quickly enough yeah so yeah. that's that was that was the impetus to come back and form this band with steve and with carrie and with robbie and with richard and uh and to get you know basically put it get it up and going yeah. and we did and it took a while but we we kind of started out as white clover and that was me and dave and Rich and Robbie and Steve. Uh, Kerry had his another band, another incarnation of Kansas, and uh, and I went over. and The first demo we made was with White Clover. It was not with Kansas. Kerry wasn't in the band yet. So the demo that we made with Can I Tell You and different things like that, we sent to Don Kirshner. When Kirshner showed the interest, that's when I went to Kerry and I said, Kerry, I think we're going to get signed. He need to join up with us, and he did. So, yeah. boom, that's the original. Right. That's where that came from. So, the impetus to leave London and missing the guys in Topeka ended up being the original sick. Yeah, yeah. So that's how that happened. That's and and had you always feel? It sounds to me like I know now you're you're the band you're the manager of the band officially. I know that you're in addition to, and I'm sure your fans know that, but other people that are watching might not know that you're actually in addition to being one of the greatest drummers in the world managing this incredible band so my my question my question is it sounds like you always had a really good sense for the direction you wanted the band to go in and and sort of shaping things and moving things in a certain direction early on right i mean you were yeah you know that's very nice of you to say i wish i could go yeah i knew all along no I, <laughs> No, no, I, I was I was a bum like the rest of us. You know, we just got in our bus and we went and we played. But once Carrie joined the band, everything changed. All of a sudden, yeah. I'm going. Steve is singing, singing Carrie songs, and Robbie, oh my gosh, what he's doing on the violin, and me and Rich and Dave putting that rock bottom down. This isn't anything like I've ever played or been a part of before. So all of a sudden, it took a whole different thing and I I became much more aggressive in trying to get this band in front of people and getting the music in front of people so we were we were fortunate but uh, what what a band that was and still yeah. is and, and still is and, yeah. and I and I mean what I say you know that I, I'll just say that you talk to any drummer and mention your name and they will immediately say great great drummer and, uh, and, you know, I, and as, as we've talked about, kind of, I, I look at you as one of these guys that's kind of an unsung hero in the sense that it comes to the respect um, and appreciation. You're, you're right up there. So appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I know I know there was a connection you had. Speaking of great drummers that also played in a prog band, the great Neil Peart. And oh, yeah. You guys yeah. had a had a friendship. There was like a, a connection to you guys and Rush there. Yes. Well, they 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 opened for us. I think it was right around the Left Overture tour, yeah. and uh, we had heard of them, but we weren't really, you know, versed in in Rush music. And the first time I really heard of, about Neil was not by his name, but by his drumming. Um, 
they were opening for us and I hadn't really gone out to check them out yet. And Rich walked in. He had been out there. He walked in the dressing room. He goes, Bill, yeah. Have you heard this drummer? <laughs> no, should I? And he goes, you might want to check this guy out. So I went out there <laughs> after I picked my jaw up off the floor, off the stage. And I was like, man. But I played Slingerland drums and he wanted to play Slingerland drums. And, and so he, he and I became friends. Uh, we, we were more acquaintances. You know, we, we spoke and talked, but it isn't like we hung out and I went up to Toronto and hung out. Or what. But, but because they were on so many dates with us, we got to spend a lot of time uh, talking to each other. And then one day he just kind of said, I'm going to ask you a favor. And I said, yeah, what, what? He said, could you get me a deal with Slingerland? And I thought, well, I don't know if I can get you a deal, but I can get you in front of them and, and you know, give you my accolades. Uh, sure. I give them my personal accolades about you and, and uh, probably make it happen. Oh, man, that'd be, he already had a Slingerland snare. Yeah. And this, this is for the drummers that are listening. And, and um, which it was an incredible snare, but he wanted the rest of the drums. And so I went to the to the artist, the guy that was the uh, head of, you know, artist relations, I guess you might say. And a good friend of mine who has since passed away. But I gave him their CD and I said, you, you got to pick this guy up. This guy is going to be one of the all timers. Oh, OK. So he listened to him and I. Two days went dot by and three days. And of course I was around Neil and he kept going, any work? Sorry, man, I haven't heard anything. Okay, let me know. And then we go out and we play more gigs and any work? No, I'm going, God. So I called this guy back and I said, you know, kind of put me in a, you know, what do you think? Yeah. I, I think we're going to pass, Phil. I think we're going to pass. It's just, I'm going, wait a minute. Did, did you listen to this guy? Yeah. Oh yeah, he's very good. But, you know, none of us here really care for the band. Oh my! Oh. And, I said, and I said, "Look, um, move the band aside for a moment. I, I think they're a great band. They're going to have a hell of a career. But you know, don't you guys sign drummers? Don't you, you know, work out deals with drummers? You did with me, yeah. But no." And I said, "Okay." I said, "You're going to go down in history. You're going to go down in history. Nobody else, just you, as the guy that turned down one of the greatest drummers." of all time. I have a good and that Man. Was it. what a, what a, I I never heard that story and I'm not surprised and with all due respect I know you played Slingerland but I've heard other stories like that where there was this uh, and and this is not to spend any time uh, yeah. as a person who worked in artist relations you know you have to put aside any personal bias but you got to put it aside. It's, yeah, he's a few memories and it, it was an I mean he was he was younger than me at the time and yeah. it was just incredible. And just every night I'd sit off to the side and go, whoa. And, and we had a mutual respect for each other. He was he was very kind to Kansas and the whole band was. They were very complimentary of us. And it was just a, a, a great combination. But to be to to turn down and oh my God. I just felt like, why don't you just pick him up for the hell of it? You know, just in case he does catch, you know, at least you have. Yeah. And, and you know, Phil, honestly, not to rewrite history, but he, that he could have potentially I don't know if he, he could have saved Slingerland, but he could have certainly given yes. them a lifeline that they eventually yes. needed, they just, as you know. Yeah. They just, you know, dive bombed after that. But it's uh but yes, he and I remained friends for a long time. Um Alex and Getty were both friends also. They they did a number of uh, charity events, tennis events that I put on raising money for Make a Wish Foundation. The two of them came down and uh played in these uh, tennis tournaments and stuff that I put in. And uh, yeah, it was always fun whipping their butts. But, <laughs> you know, I'm being sarcastic. But anyway, it's um, the, all three of them were uh, very, very good friends with Kansas and yeah. uh, consider ourselves good friends of theirs. That's you know? great. And I, I, ha I have to say, now, I, I've never told you this. I, actually, I might have told you this a long time ago when I first met you, but yeah. I the very first time, very first time I met you was at a Chicago Summer NAMM show. And you and I remember those. A lot of people, I'm sure, don't remember when the NAMM show was in Chicago okay. during the summer. Oh, I, I, I did. Yeah. And this would have been, the and, and you wouldn't remember this, but it was the early 1980s. And, I, and you were at the Slingerland booth. You were still with Slingerland at that time. 
Yeah. And I, I saw you and you might have even been demonstrating or just signing autographs, but I recognized you. I, I was in my early 20s. I was working at a music store and it was my first NAMM show. Yeah. And I approached you and just said, Phil, I'm a big fan of yours. And you're like, great. Nice to meet you. You know, and, and that, that was it. But um, anyway, you were you were you're very kind and very humble. And um, that's OK. Years later. Yeah. I, years I, later. I was going to. I was going to borrow money from you. <laughs> I, I had none to loan you in those days. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. No, but oh. I remember you, it was, it was a big thrill for me to see you. And, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking like, wow, the NAMM show is so cool. I met Phil Ehart just hanging at the Slingerland booth, you know, it was. Yeah, that, that's exciting. what we did. A lot of us would, would go there and hang with the people that sponsored us and that sponsored our tours and got the, you know, you'd break something and be there the next day. I mean, that was that was nothing to take for granted to have a, an end with, with companies like that. And Zildjian was the same way. And um, it was uh, to this day, you know, Yamaha is since Slinger and left. I'm with Yamaha and have been for 40 years now. Yeah. And uh, Zildjian, the same amount of time. So it, it means a lot. It's not only friendship. It's the quality of the uh, gear that you folks had that we needed. And, uh, you know, it was, I was happy to do it. And, well, do you get paid to endorse them? Uh, no, you don't get paid. No, <laughs> I know. I know. We know, a, we know drummers that did get paid to endorse and, and it was, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to take free stuff and still get paid at the same time. That, that didn't seem right to me. And, uh, to the day I, I endorse this stuff because I believe in it and I'm pr proud to be up there with it, you know, every night. Exactly. So yeah. And, and, uh, it was a, you know, an, an honor for me to, to, and I'm, I'm glad you're still, you know, you're still there with Zildjian and they're taking care of you, but it was an honor for me to work with you and yeah, and Eric well, and, it know. was, we became good friends. Yeah, absolutely. I still, I still need to borrow that money from you. <laughs> Looking at all those gold and platinum records on the wall. I don't know about that. <laughs> I guess I could sell them, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is quite a drum room. I'm, I'm so glad you're, you're, um, you're in your room and in your element there. It's that's a beautiful yes. room. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And yeah. I was going to I was going to mention too, um, yeah. talking about drums for a second. Uh, I know we talked about our, our sadly departed uh, late friend, Lenny DiMuzio, who yeah. was my friend and, and mentor at Zildjian. And yeah. I know that he had the great idea to put you on a I think it was a Zildjian day in Dallas, maybe back in the in the 1980s and he was I, and I have to tell you Phil Lenny Lenny had a, he was a he was a visionary in the sense that you know he in those days he looked at you as one of the young cats because Buddy was still alive and Louis Belson and all the you know the greats that we grew up listening to and and he wanted to put some some of the new guys out there at a Zildjian day so I, I'd love for you to tell that story because I know that it had to be just completely um <laughs> nerve-wracking for you well there's a couple I, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about the zildjian day that was a little bit more uh good news than okay. the one that wasn't i'm gonna choose that zildjian okay. day but but lenny had called me and said phil you know lenny hey lenny yeah, i want you to come out to the zildjian day in los angeles well i'd never been to a zildjian day and i knew what they were but they had the great i mean you know steve gad and tony williams and uh, Larry London, you know, it was Elvis's, and all these great drummers. And I'm kind of going, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a little above my head. Like, no, no. You know why? No, because you will be the only band guy there. Oh, well, all these other guys are studio. He called them cats. Cats, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, studio cats. Okay, great. We want you to talk about being in Kansas because there will be drummers there that are in bands. In fact, most of them will be there in bands. We want you to, and we had, uh, uh, I think, uh, now Steve Smith from Journey was going to be there, but I was taking his place. That's how I've been there. Yep. And uh, so I went, and uh, and I'm sitting there and, uh, backstage, and you know, he's got Carmine was there. I mean, drummer after incredible drummer just came on and just, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? Well, there was another guy feeling the same way. 
and he was talking to me, and it was Larry London, the drummer for Elvis, as well as the Everly Brothers, number one call drummer in Nashville. Yeah. You're the you're the number one guy on everybody's, you know, Rolodex or whatever in Nashville. You got to be incredible. And he he said, Phil, uh, my name's Larry London. I go, hey, Larry. He said, Kai, you know, I just you know, I I brought my albums to sign. We <laughs> went, yeah, okay. So he brings out all these albums. I'm sitting. There. I go. I said, Larry, what, what's the matter, man? You seem real emotional. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, what do you mean? He, I said, you've never done a clinic or anything? No. This, I, I don't know what I'm... I said, all right. Well, what was the last session you did? And he goes, well, yesterday I was doing a session for Dolly Parton. I said, there you go. I guarantee you there's not one of us in here that's played at all with Dolly Parton. <laughs> so you think any of these young people are going to know anything about Dolly Parton playing with Dolly Parton, Dolly Parton's band, you know, any of that kind of stuff. That's what you can talk about. Well, I hadn't really thought about that. I said, that's what you talk about. What did she have you do in the session? And he said, well, she wanted me to play a beat that sounded like a one hump camel. <laughs> okay. Talk about that. You know, and he goes, well, I, I think I can do this. That started his, uh, clinic career, he never came back. I mean, he went on to be one of the most, and I, I'm not taking any credit. He just talked about what he knew. Yeah, yeah. And that's all I said. Don't, don't try to be me or somebody, you know, don't try, you know, be, be you. And the crowd just ate him up and he went on to be, uh, you know, a very big influence for a lot of young drummers sure. uh, in the world that ended up going to uh, Nashville because of Larry London. And uh, he eventually passed away, but uh, I, I know, yeah. But that was sad. But it was, uh, but yeah, that was my Zildjian day. That uh, that I'm choosing to talk about. There are others, but that was a that was a happy ending. Well, I and I'm sure you, I'm sure you blew everybody away when you got up to play too. I mean, that's I have no doubt about that. In fact, no, I, I, not, you know, Steve Gad. I mean, seriously, nobody's going. Any, you know, Gad's there. I mean, he's the king of the mountain. At least he was then. Uh, there are other drummers that have come along, but but I appreciate you saying that. But I did well representing Kansas, and this is how Kansas developed songs. And these are some of the beats that I play in Kansas music, and it worked great. You know, "Carry On Wayward Son" was yeah. uh, moving along at that time, so I, you know, I kind of dissected that song, and uh, and it made a lot of drummers happy because there's parts in there that they want to kill me over because they can't quite figure out what it is. So I I would show them what it is, but it, it went by quickly. And, and, uh, and, and I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. I, I want to talk about that song too, for a second. And, and maybe we could just take a second here, but we'll come back to it again. But yeah. um, was that, was that, I mean, would you consider that song to be the sort of real breakthrough song for the band or was there? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, there was, there were songs before, but that was really the one that. It, well, it was, it was our first big hit. We didn't yeah. have anything really hit wise on the radio. We had, you know, there was FM radio and we were on the radio, but we didn't have something that was played all over the world, yeah, like yeah. Wayward Son was, and was a smash hit all over the United States. So, yeah, that was a big breakout song for us. Though. And as most Kansas fans will know, hi to all the Kansas fans out there, is um, that it almost didn't make the album. We were working up Left Overture, and we were in a little strip mall in Topeka, and we had been working up. Carrie was coming in with great songs. Steve and he were working on things, and we were all working on it, and we had all the songs we needed. We were ready to go. And and so I'm breaking down my drums. This is before we had a crew or anything. And Carrie walks over, and I see him kind of standing there. I'm, yeah, Livo, what's up? And he goes, um, I need to talk to you. I thought, boy, I must have screwed something up really bad beat-wise. You know, I, I immediately go to the drum, you know. And he <laughs> said, no, let's talk in the back room. So I went back there and he goes, Phil, I, I, I've got another song. I said, well, Carrie, it's kind of late. We've already worked up everything. The songs we're going to put on left overture. And he goes, now you need to hear this one. And I said, well, we've already broken everything. He said, well, let's listen to it when we get to the studio. Okay. And he said, it it's really worth it. I, I think we ought to work this up. I said, okay. So we got to the studio and uh, we got everything set up and Carrie started showing it, you know, to everybody, you know, down, 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 and showing Steve the, the melodies and he had the lyrics and everything. And 
So <laughs> we went through it and we went through it. And, and Jeff Glixman, our producer comes out, he says, that sounds really good. Why don't, why don't we just cut it and see what it sounds like? So we recorded that track with about two or three rehearsals You're in kidding. the studio. And, and we kept my drum track. And you know, dun, 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 you know, putting all the beats that, dun, 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 you know, the whole offbeat thing. I just kind of came up with. I didn't know if it was going to stick or not. Then we kept the whole drum track. Dun, 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 dun. It goes into the six eight part, you know. And I just thought, well, I'll just put that on there, and and it worked. And we kept most. I won't say we kept everybody's parts. I, I can't speak for everybody, but I know for mine and and. Uh, Steve had uh, had, had a, a friend pass away up in St. Joe, Missouri. He came back, and that's when he added the the vocal and the uh, acapella beginning. Yeah. See that? Okay. That wasn't yeah. that wasn't in the original version. That was Steve's addition and putting that on there, which set the song up immediately. You know, and so that song got the least amount of attention as far as rehearsal and recording and overdubs. We just put it out. And out it went, and off it took. See, that's so, why, that's unbelievable, Phil. That's why I, I said earlier, that drum part alone is one of those songs that every one of us drummers of a certain age listen to a thousand times, you know, and come on the radio and I'd air drum to it, driving in my car. And it was such a challenge to like get all, hit all those hits that you were doing, all those accents. Um, <laughs> I'd like to play the song. If well, that's a challenge, but no, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to play it if, if, if you don't mind. I'd... Go right ahead. I, I think it'd be great. I mean, it's, it's you and me. Beautiful. Right. I was just going to say, too, I know all your fans, all the Kansas fans out there probably know every, every hit and every, but I just think this is a song for all the drummers watching to just really listen to this song and listen to the part you came up with is so brilliant and so incredible it really is i think you don't get enough credit you don't take enough credit for how great this drum part is it's oh, i appreciate it thank you absolutely well here it comes all right i'm here right here i'm right here carry on my wayward son there'll be peace when you are done lay your weary head to rest don't you cry no more
John, you sounded great. <laughs> what a great recording, too. Wow. Oh, man, Phil. I, take a bow, my friend. That song, <laughs> it's timeless. I, and I, I know the answer to this question I'm going to ask you anyway, though. You must still love playing that song. That's you it's play my it. favorite song every night. Oh, that's great to hear that. I was afraid, and I knew you weren't going to say, oh, man, we have to play that at every show. And I'm... I mean, what a what a joy it must be to play those incredible parts. Uh, it's yeah. I mean, of course, the rest of the band's smoking too. I mean, of course, those leads, yeah. they're playing, and Steve's vocals, Dave. I mean, everybody is just you know. That's why we kept the recording because that's what we captured very early on in the recording process. And we kind of looked at each other and went, "I think we're done," and and we left it as such. You know. It's not yeah. overproduced or anything. It's, uh, I think we come pretty close to sounding like that uh, every night when we play. So it's, it's, uh, no, it, it, that's, that's one of a kind song. And it's it one sure of is. It, you know, you hit the nail on the head too. When, uh, to me, the more I listen to it, the more I hear it, it, I realize how actually organic it is. As you say, it, you can almost at a first listen to think it, it's not overly produced, but this was punched in or that was put the, you know, like if, in other words, if a band made that record today, we both know they'd, they'd layer this in there, but th this was back when records were made by a band and a room, everybody, you weren't playing to a click track and your time no is, there's no click track. No. Yeah. And it's, it's absolutely spot on. I mean, it's just the, the time is perfect. You move in all the different places. You set up all the choruses with these great setups, these great fills that bring in these other transitional parts. It's an incredible tune, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I got to, yeah, the, the, the audience watching, you know, we've got a bunch of people watching this live and, and everybody was just commenting on how much they love this song. It was- Well, yeah, it changed our career. You know, yeah, the yeah. success of that song is really why I'm talking to you today. You know, while we're having a, you know, 50th anniversary, that that song just boom uh, came at a great time. And it's a great song and it has a it has legs. I mean, it it still goes to this day. So it's. Uh, yeah, we yep. love, we love playing it every night. I'm, every sure, night. That, that, I'm sure you do. Yeah. And I'm sure it's a thrill for the audience when when that when that those. Uh, I'm sure you do it like the record too with the the acapella. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's yeah. Yeah, it, that, that would be a very dangerous song to change. <laughs> yeah, but, but sometimes we extend a part or you know whatever. But most of the time, it's it's just like that, you know. And, and yes. it's a blast. It's really a blast. Well, I and I want to I want to take a second too. We'll talk about the 50th anniversary and maybe some things that you have planned for next year. But there were a couple more things I wanted to sort of jog your memory about i know there's a great story and this goes back now to sort of the early days of your career and the, and the band's career with you guys playing um at a festival with janis joplin in, in new orleans actually at the yeah. new orleans pop festival yeah and i, I again uh, yeah. I, <laughs> back to new orleans yes i was just going to say i what i think is so great about this is that you know, like here you are today in 2023, but you have this career that has touched on Jim Morrison and 
Janis Joplin, these iconic musicians, you know, sadly that aren't with us anymore, but, but you've had this little sprinkling and these, these, you know, connections with these people. Yeah. Not to mention Queen. 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 Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. We toured them quite a bit too, as well as the the Rush guys. And uh, we've, we've been very fortunate, the people that we've toured with and met. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of weird sitting here even talking about it because it it's not like we sit around and listen to our own stuff. Oh, let's put on Wayward Son. Oh yeah. No, I mean it's it's um but when you do listen to it again and and uh, are exposed to what that time was, like this Janice Joplin thing, you know, that uh, it's weird that you mentioned it because again, it's a, a very odd story of us playing uh, in New Orleans at that bar and and the whole Woodstock group of bands was coming through the United States and coming through New Orleans. And so New Orleans had been informed that they were getting basically Woodstock. They called it, you know, the, the uh, New Orleans pop festival, because there was a lot of pop festivals at the time. But again, you know, I'm, I'm pushing 19 years old and, and, you know, wow, these bands are coming to town and uh, guys, you're, you're going to, and it was quite clever. You're, you're going to be on the, on the show. Uh, you'll be playing after a band called Santana. Anybody? <laughs> oh, we didn't know who the hell Santana was. And we thought, he goes, I, I know they have bongos and congas in them. We thought, well, shit, we're going to blow these guys off the stage. You know? <laughs> Glad I didn't say that out loud back then. <laughs> but it just seemed like, okay, we'll follow Santana. Well, there was two stages. Okay, there was two stages. There was a stage with the performing band, and then the other stage was the other band setting up. So as soon as one ended, the other one started up. And so we're, we're over there setting up our little diddly diddly little drummies and our little amps and stuff. And Santana's playing Soul Sacrifice. You know, Michael Shreve, I was just going, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> what a trouble. We had no idea. And we thought, how, how are we going to follow these guys? This is going to be, you know, it's like, I think at the time in the evening, there was about forty to 50,000 people there. Well, I'm sure they'd go, yeah, nice job there, Mike Glover. Never mind. But the sheriff came in after Santana and shut down the festival for the night. Oh, for a no, noise abatement or whatever. So we were going to be the first band the next day. Okay, we can do that. We can play with the sun's coming up, whatever. So we went up there and we played our little 45 minute, 50 minute set of cover songs. I mean, we had a couple of originals, but we kind of opened the day. And we got done and we got a okay reception, you know, polite. Okay, next. And it was something that, um, so I'm, Loading up my drums again, again, no road crew, doing everything, and I and I'm start and so I'm starting to carry the drums down off these big stages. And I hear this, hey, hey, you, and it's Janice Joplin. She's sitting outside her trailer. I think I think we didn't stick around, but I think she was to go on after us or later after. Us. And she said, "Come here, I want to talk to you." She wants to talk to me. Okay, so I said. <laughs> set the drum down and I walk over do you say yes ma'am Jan- I, I'm glad I did I don't, I don't think she would but it, I, I went over and I said so I just thought yeah yeah what can I help you with she said I want to tell you something she said don't ever quit don't ever quit you're really good you are really good don't ever quit wow okay <laughs> no, <laughs> argue with her but Wow. I mean, it was just, this is Janice Joplin. This isn't, yeah. you know, somebody that was selling Coke from a, you know, a machine or something. It was Janice yeah. Joplin, don't yeah. ever quit. And she was yeah. looking at, right in my, I mean, she was aggressive, you know, and it wasn't like, yeah, you guys are pretty good. You guys are good. And don't you ever quit. And I got to think, Phil, as an 18 year old, you know, that yeah. must have resonated so strong you know it, it's weird it didn't at the time because i was so struck by her saying it, it took me a while to kind of sit down and go wow that that's you know that was really something and it to this day 
You know, don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. And I tried not to. So it is something that uh, the other guys, <laughs> the other guys were off stage. You know, they were back to the dressing room. They're watching me talk to Janice Joplin. <laughs> and, and, and as I came back, they go, what the hell, what did she say? And I said, so I told her. And one of the guys goes, well, did she say anything about me? <laughs> no, sorry, dude. it didn't work out that way. <laughs> I should have said, oh, yeah, man, she was raving about you, you know? <laughs> oh. Those uh, guitar players, they're always looking for the accolades, you know, they're always... Yeah. That was okay, that was okay. But... Uh, that was the last time I got to see her. But that, that whole pop festival had a major effect on me because it was, at, it was at the time I wasn't sure, do I want to continue with this? Do I really want to yeah. um, you know, keep doing this? The, the dates are getting, the gigs are getting thinner and, and so am I because I'm not eating. And, and it's the kind of thing that, uh, that made a difference. Yeah. Yeah, it had to have. I was, I was going to say that's what. Yeah, and maybe if not right at that moment, I'm sure. I'm sure on reflection, you know, just having oh, someone yeah. like that encourage you and say you're really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, that's... it wasn't just anybody. It was Janice freaking Joplin that yeah. had said that, and she was looking right at me, and it it made an impact to this day. Yeah. Day, yeah. So, yeah. So thanks um, for. I don't know where you heard that, but thank you. That is a. One of the stories I don't normally tell because it puts a pretty big spotlight on me, and and uh, but I wanted it to be on her, and and for her to say something like that was very nice. Well, it was very nice for her to do that. Thanks for telling that story, Phil, and and I hope you don't mind. But today, this is the spotlight's on you, whether you like it or not. It's going to be on you. Okay. So, <laughs> thank right. you, okay. and and um. You're welcome. So, so you know, and I didn't realize till recently that you're that you're managing the band, and and uh, and yeah. that's maybe that's been a little while now. I know, so sorry for yeah. not. Or it's been forty years I've managed the band. Oh, you've it's been that long. I thought it was just in the last ten years or so. No, I, in the last ten years I was managing the band too, but it goes <laughs> back uh, forty years ago when our manager Bud Carr, who was a great manager and a good yeah. friend to this day, had a chance to go in to. Uh, films to go into uh, movies and doing music, not doing the music, but putting the music together for Oliver Stone's movies and stuff like that. So he wrote, wrote me a nice one, just said, I'm heading into films and what I'm going to do, wish you all the best. I'm around if you ever need to call me or whatever. So I went to Steve and to Rich and sat down with them and just said, uh, you know, I've kind of been not managing the band, but working with Bud and stuff like that. And I said, I'd like to manage the band until we find another manager. And they said, okay, they, they were very supportive. I would not, would not have done it if yeah. Steven yeah. would have gone, no, nah, dude, ain't gonna happen. Um, and that was 40 years ago and I'm still managing the band. So I must've done something right, I guess. But, um, you know, appreciate Steve and Rich saying that. It meant a lot because yeah. I hadn't really, I didn't really have a long list of bands. I had managed zero. <laughs> And um, so it was great that they had that trust in me yeah. to do that. It said a lot. So, well, and that's, uh, yeah, and that's why I asked, as, as we talked about earlier too, where I could tell that you've, you've always had um, a, a natural sort of way of just, you know, having, having some involvement uh, with the direction of the band, you know, with, without being overly uh controlling or you know uh, the other guys in the band were too big they were big guys you know uh nobody tells richard anything you know it's <laughs> kind of thing you sit down with rich and you discuss it and you want him to hear what you got to say and to this day he and i are very close in 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 how the band is laid out and how it's performed and you know i'll come up with a set list but i don't present it to anybody until i show it to rich he's my bandmate you know yeah Yep. That's great. That's, that's, that's what's kept you. That's what's kept it all going so long too, is that respect for I each other. So. And, yeah. I think so. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. And so, so you're going to, this is the 50th year this year, but I'm sure next year you'll be celebrating it some more. And I'm sure. We'll, lots see, of yeah. we'll see. We, we have no, we have no plans to go away, yeah. but that doesn't mean we won't. It, it, um, Right now, it's going great. The gigs are great. 
doing the 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 fiftieth uh, is awesome. The band the band that we have together, are great guys, great players, and just and the audiences show up and very supportive. And uh, we've even made some new records that were you know rela- uh, released in the last uh, number of years, and are very proud of them. So new material sometimes pops up, and so it, it's a very uh, creative band. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and it's 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 been great. And, you know, and I, I want all the drummers watching because, you know, we, we do have a lot of drummers watching, I'm sure, to know yeah. that last week when we spoke, I, you know, we had a great phone call, you and I, and and uh, I was I was not surprised when you said to me, uh, I think as we were as we were saying goodbye, you said, OK, I got to go practice now because and I just thought there's a guy that's dedicated to his his art. And and I thought to myself, managing the band and all that it's involved with that and still taking time to just sit down and, and spend time behind the drums and practicing. So yeah, hats off. Hats off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's still fun. Yeah, you know, it, it's gotta be fun. It's too hard if it's not fun. If you're not having fun doing this, you need to do something else. Yeah. And if you're not sweating every night, you need to do something else. You need to work hard, practice hard and give a shit about what you're doing. Because there's a lot of people out there paying money to come and see you. You owe them. Amen. You owe them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I Before I let you go, and this has been such a blast, and I thank you so much for taking time to do this today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do. I, there's, a, there's one more story I'd love for you to tell, and this is a, a story I think you told me some time ago that um, it has to do with you being at the movies and, and being the famous drummer that you are being recognized by a fan. If you remember that story. <laughs> oh yeah, that one. Uh, sure. Sure. If you want, if you'd like to hear it, sure. I'd, I'd lo- I well, think people would love to hear that too. Okay. All right. It's very humbling. It's a very humbling story. So we all need that occasionally. But uh, <laughs> we were in Los Angeles uh, recording a, an album called In the Spirit of Things. And we were there for quite a while with Bob Eslin, who is Pink Floyd's uh, producer among other bands, but uh, he was producing this record. Well, as Bob tends to do, he kicks your butt in the studio. He makes you work hard, it's long hours. And one day he, he gave us the day off. He said, I know, you know, this is pretty grueling. Um, he said, why don't you guys just take the afternoon off and I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, so I was walking out of the studio with uh, Steve Walsh, our singer, and our guitar player, Steve Morse. And uh, and I think Steve, I think Steve was going to see a movie. He was always going to see movies. And he said, uh, I'm gonna go to Universal and see something. You guys wanna go? Okay, so it's me, Steve Walsh, fairly famous singer, and Steve Morse, fairly well-known guitar player. Oh yeah. It was the three of us piling in a rental car and going to Universal. So we get there, and of course the, the line is running outside. We're outdoors and stuff. So we, we get in line, we're in no rush. And uh, we got the day off, so we're in no hurry. And, uh, and I kind of turned around, and Steve and Steve were here in front of me, and I was kind of standing in the back, and I turned around. And there was three teenagers there, uh, uh, males, and um, they were talking among them among themselves, but they were pointing at us, you know, kind of, you know, they kind of giggled, and, you know, and I thought, well, it's one of those, well, we've probably been recognized and whatever. And, uh, and you know, people act like it's a pain, but it's nice to be recognized for what you do. But um, so as the line is moving forward, they're, they're still pointing and laughing and waving. He kind of waved back, not knowing what they're saying. But you keep, keep going. And we got to a point where we were waiting for a while. And the taller guy, might have been the older guy, I don't know, but he walks over and he goes, to me, the other two guys are, are looking that way. And I look back at him, you know, keep my eye on him. And uh, <laughs> he comes up and he goes, uh, excuse me, is, uh, are you in a band? I thought, okay, well, I'm doomed. Um, y- yeah, yeah, I-, I am in a band. And he goes, well, well, uh, is your name Phil? I thought, okay, well, yeah, my name is Phil. Guys, it is, it's Phil Collins. <laughs> I mean, it was, um, I, I got what I deserved. You know, it's like, 
yeah, you know, boom, boy, you're done. The air is let out. You're about two feet tall. And I, I just thought, well, do I tell him? And uh, well, I didn't say I was Phil Collins. I said, with all due respect, I, I love Phil Collins, but I am not Phil Collins. Oh, oh, okay. He didn't. He didn't then go. Well, then who are you? He just right. goes. Okay. If I wasn't Phil Collins, he was out of there. And so he left, and that that was fine. But it <laughs> it keeps you humble, you know. You, yeah, yeah, I've been recognized. No, you haven't. And somebody <laughs> else, you know, you might they think you're somebody else, which was. The guys in the band got a great kick out of that, you oh. know, because we all go through that, you know, and I've, I've come out of airports with our road manager and, you know, you'll have people carrying big stacks of albums for you to sign at airports for the city you're going to play. I've had, you know, I've been standing there with my road manager and a fan, a fan with about 30 records comes up and asks my road manager, is Phil on the flight? <laughs> is, is Phil Billy Hart on the flight? I'm standing next to the guy. I thought I'm not going to say anything if he doesn't recognize. If he doesn't know I'm Phil, I'm not going to embarrass him. I mean, he'd probably be very embarrassed. And our roadman said, "Yeah, he's he's on the flight." Oh, great! And eventually, I had him go get that guy and bring him back. And I said, "Uh, uh-uh, Phil, he hurt. Oh man, I said, don't worry about it. What albums do you want signed? Yeah, I don't know. Can I just sign him? He was happy, and I, I wasn't going to embarrass him. That." That would have been brutal. Yeah, you know? you're a good man. Your That's... Problem, you know? No, I, I would never be that way. But I thought it was nice that I was this far from his face. <laughs> and he goes, is Phil on the flight? And of course, the road <laughs> manager wanted to go, well, yeah, you're looking at him. But he was great, too. He didn't He didn't do that. We didn't embarrass yeah. anybody. So, oh, yeah, it, the world is full of things. And you got to roll with it. You know, you, you, you got to roll with stuff because it's not always. Uh, but it's always funny. Later, it always makes for a great story. And, yeah, you know, always go with a great story. That's good. These are so, great yeah. stories, man. And I, you know, it's no wonder all those, you know, all those years, all those tours, you got many great stories. <laughs> we do sometimes too many, but uh, no complaining. Yeah, no complaining. Yeah. The, the Queen tours that we were on, and uh, the Skinner tours, all, all the stuff that we did with all the great bands. We, we're so proud to be part of those tours because they were just such, uh, and still are. So, you know, great. Happy to be there. That's great. Well, Phil, man, thank you so much for being here today. And I know Good I for yeah, thanks for taking the time. That's a lot of time. But but thank you. And I had to set all this stuff up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, it. Uh, th- thanks for having me on. Much appreciated. It's and been good an luck. absolute pleasure. Good luck to you, dude. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, please, please stay with me for one minute. I'm going to end oh. the live stream and we'll, we'll say goodbye. But I want to thank everybody for watching and please yeah. put your hands together for the great Phil Ehart, my dear friend, incredible drummer, incredible human. All right. Well, that's my show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, leave me a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. And the podcast is available on all the podcast platforms. So download it. And remember, no drummers are ever harmed on Live From My Drum Room or Track Talk. And drummers, when in doubt, leave it out. All right. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you again real soon. See ya.